Jesus has been spending intimate time with his disciples. He knows his hour has come and he has been pouring into them, giving instruction and encouragement, telling them what's to come, strengthening them with promises, wanting his joy and peace in them to be full. Now his disciples get to hear their Lord and Savior intercede for them. We get to hear as well as Jesus also prays for all who would believe. It is an amazing prayer of our high priest. I'm in John chapter 17 verse 1 reading from the New American Standard Version. Jesus spoke these things and lifting up his eyes to heaven he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him he may give eternal life. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. This is truly amazing to be able to hear Jesus' words to the Father, to hear his heart in this way, to hear what he's asking of the Father. It's amazing to hear the truth he conveys just as a side note. He says, glorify me together with yourself. That's the prayer. Then he adds, with the glory I had with you before the world was. Before the world was. Takes us back to John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The glory I had with you before the world was. We can't even imagine what that glory was like. Notice the authority Jesus has. Authority over all flesh, over all mankind. Mankind which was created through him. He's the author of life and he gives eternal life. Jesus has accomplished the work that he was given to do on earth. He has glorified the Father and the Father will glorify the Son. Continuing verse 6. I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words which you gave me I have given to them, and they received them, and truly understood that I came forth from you, and they believed that you sent me. I ask on their behalf. I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom you have given me, for they are yours." And all things that are mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. Notice how many times Jesus refers to what the Father has given. Verse 2, Jesus says, You gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. Verse 4, Jesus refers to, the work which you have given me to do. Verse 6, Jesus speaks of the men whom you gave me out of the world. He says, they were yours and you gave them to me. Verse 7, he says, everything you have given me is from you. Verse 8, the words which you gave me I have given to them. Verse 9, Jesus says he's asking, he's praying on behalf of those whom you have given me, for they are yours. The sovereignty of God is on display. It brings to mind Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and all it contains, 
the world and those who dwell in it. How comforting and powerful to know that as believers, we are counted among those for whom Jesus is praying. Those who have been given to Jesus, who belong to the Father. This is why no one is able to snatch us out of the Father's hand. We belong to him. Continuing verse 11. I am no longer in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me, and I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. Jesus says, I am no longer in the world. He has yet to die on the cross and be resurrected, but he is already looking forward. Despite the agony to come, his focus is on those who believe in him, those who will be in the world still. And what's his prayer? Holy Father, keep them in your name. I love that our God is a God who keeps us. Psalm 121, 5 through 8. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. The Lord will guard your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever. And this is what Jesus prays. Holy Father, keep them in your name. So much wrapped up in God keeping us. So much protection. So much power. So much comfort. So much peace. Jesus says, keep them that they may be one even as we are. He returns to this throughout his prayer. The will of God is that his followers be one, that we dwell together in unity. How interesting that the Lord's keeping of us is related to our dwelling in unity. Jesus says, I was keeping them and I guarded them. He's the good shepherd, but now that he's leaving, he's looking to the Father. He says again, verse 15, keep them. And he adds, from the evil one. The God of this world hates not only Jesus, but those who belong to him, those who follow him. The enemy hates saving faith. He would love nothing more than to thwart the spread of the gospel, to destroy the testimony of those who believe, to render powerless our profession of faith. We need protection from the evil one. And our high priest, Jesus, prays for our protection. As we sit here over 2,000 years later, the gospel spread around the world. We praise the Lord for his faithfulness in answering this prayer continually. Continuing verse 16. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. Jesus has made specific requests of the Father. He said, glorify your Son. Glorify me together with yourself. He said, Holy Father, keep them in your name. Keep them from the evil one. Now he says, sanctify them in the truth. 
to sanctify means to make holy. Jesus is praying, make them holy, separate them from sin. How is this accomplished? With truth. Jesus says your word is truth. It's the word of God that sanctifies us, that renews our minds, gives us the mind of Christ. It's the word of God that causes us to be transformed from glory to glory into the image of Christ. God's word is truth. It's life unto us. Continuing verse 20. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them, even as you have loved me. Verse 20 lets us know that we are not simply listening to our Savior pray for the 11 disciples who are with him. We are listening to him pray for us, for all who believe in him. Jesus intercedes for us, even now, always. But being able to know what he's prayed is such immense comfort and encouragement. So he says he's praying for all who believe. And what is he praying? That they may all be one. He says it three times. And Jesus gives the standard for that unity. He says, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us. That's a supreme standard of unity. That's a unity that requires eyes fixed on Jesus, hearts and minds focused on glorifying him, minds renewed with the word of God, people who are being sanctified with truth. It seems an impossible standard to have this level of unity. The unity that's shared by the Godhead among believers. But this is Jesus' prayer. By the Spirit of God, all things are possible. And by the Spirit of God, it's up to each of us to seek the Lord as to how we can grow in unity with fellow believers. It's hard to even wrap our minds around the fact that as believers, Jesus is in us and we are in him and we are all one. And look at why unity is so important. Jesus says, verse 21, so that the world may believe that you sent me. And verse 23, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. Our unity is evangelistic. It draws people to Christ. It testifies to who he is. It even testifies as to God's love. Continuing verse 24. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have made your name known to them, and will make it known, so that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. O oh, this additional request by Jesus to the Father. He says it's his desire that they, that we, be with him where he is. And he's not talking about there in Jerusalem. Remember, he's already looking forward. He said in verse 11, I am no longer in the world. He's talking about heaven. Think about that. He wants us to be there with him. 
he's praying for that and he says so that they may see my glory which you have given me John said in chapter 1 verse 14 we saw his glory glory as of the only begotten from the Father full of grace and truth Jesus's glory was revealed as he walked the earth but he was clothed in human flesh not even his disciples saw his full glory Peter James and John got a glimpse when Jesus took them up on a mountain and he was transfigured before them his face shone like the Sun garments turned white as light they saw him talking to Moses and Elijah the father spoke from heaven and the disciples fell face to the ground imagine what it will be like when we see Jesus in full glory that day is coming Jesus ends his prayer speaking again of love he's made the father's name known so that his love may be in us and Jesus in us that's the prayer of our Savior full of love for us care and concern protection sanctification and his desire that we be one in him I want to go back to verse 3 where Jesus said this is eternal life that they may know you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent when we think of eternal life we tend to think of heaven far off and it's a glorious thought as Jesus said we'll be with him able to see his glory but eternal life is now 1st John 5 13 these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life and what is a supreme blessing of eternal life that we may know the Father the only true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent eternal life means we can know our God and we are ever growing in our knowledge of him as we walk with him as we meditate on his word we know him more deeply let's meditate on this prayer praising and thanking Jesus our high priest and let us walk richly in this life we've been given by knowing our God more deeply and clinging to him fiercely